Beckett, who is shortly going to present to us. Um, just before the talk, I've got one or two notices for you. Um, the next meeting is going to be our AGM and it will be held on Zoom. It's on the 20th of March and will be followed by a talk, details of which will be sent to you nearer the time. One of the items at the AGM will be a change of name of the society from Beaconsfield and District Historical Society to Beaconsfield Historical Society, which the committee feels is more appropriate for 2021. We just wanted to flag this up before the meeting, but however, details, as I say, will be sent to you prior to the AGM. Unfortunately, because of the continuing pandemic, we will not be able to start our summer outings in April. We're hoping to start them in June, but of course it all depends if we're able to operate them safely. Jane and David will make sure that you're all kept informed as to what's going on. Because of that, we've scheduled two more Zoom talks, one in April and one in May. Again, details to follow. During this presentation, I'd be grateful if you could keep yourselves muted. At the end, Ian is happy to have questions. To do this, please unmute yourself, or if you would prefer, you can type your question into the chat. But firstly, a little bit about our speaker. Professor Ian Beckett retired as a professor of military history from the University of Kent in 2015. He was born at Whitchurch and educated at Aylesbury Grammar School and the universities of Lancaster and London. A fellow of the Royal Society, he has held chairs in both the UK and in the US. He was chairman of the Army Records Society from 2000 to 2014 and has been secretary to the trustees of the Bucks Military Museum since its inception in 1985 as well as a long-term member of the Executive Council of the Bucks Records Society. He is internationally known for his work on the history of the British Army and on the First World War. However, his most recent book is Rourke's Drift and Isandlwana, and that was published in 2019. I will now hand over to Professor Beckett, who is going to tell us all about Zulu, fact, fiction and film. So if Professor Beckett would like to unmute himself, we can then... Hi, right. yes. There you are. Okay, okay. <laughs> thank you. All right. well, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it, it's rather strange to, to be talking to a society in Buckinghamshire and not actually talking about Buckinghamshire history. So th this is a, is a bit new for me. Um, the the Anglo-Zulu War uh, of 1879, was almost the shortest of all the Victorian small wars. And yet it's become certainly now, I think, almost the best known. Now, it did have quite a significant impact in Britain at the time, but it was very soon forgotten, uh, certainly by the middle of the 1880s. So, for example, there was a book that was published in 1936 on the war, and that was the first for about 50 years. And one of the reviewers said that the battles of the war mean nothing to the present generation. But there was then this kind of extraordinary revival of interest in the Zulu War in the 1960s. And that owed a great deal to the juxtaposition of two things. First was a book published by an American called The Washing of the Spears in 1965, Donald Morris. But much more importantly, there was the premiere of Zulu in January of 1964, starring, of course, uh, Stanley Baker uh, and a sort of a youngish Michael Caine. He was actually 31 at, at the time. Now, there may be some younger members of the audience out there, I don't know, uh, but you know, there was a time, uh, it may be hard to believe, before streaming and Blu-ray and uh, DVD and even VHS, when if you really enjoyed a film, uh, then you'd have to wait until it came round to the cinemas again. And I think the, the popularity of Zulu uh, is testified to the fact that it wasn't shown on British television until December of 1976. 
And there were these multiple cinematic re-releases in 1967, in 1970, in 1972, and earlier in 1976. But as we shall see, uh, the film reproduces various stereotypes, but also it created a lot of myths of its own, one of which you see here on the screen, but I will come back to that a little bit later. Uh, curiously enough, on, on film four this week, they've been showing a film called Apache Drums, a Western, and that's where the singing of Men of Harlick comes from. Uh, it's, it's sung in Welsh in Apache drums, and that's where they got the idea from for Zulu. But I, I digress. Um, now, the, the book and the film together resulted in this tremendous extra interest about um, Rourke's, the defense of Rourke's Drift on the 22nd and the 23rd of January, 1879, and the disaster that had befallen the British army that morning on the 22nd at Isandwana. And the film certainly led to this revival of interest since the 1960s. And there's been a lot of new interpretation uh, since then, particularly in more recent years, people have begun to look at the now once inaccessible uh, and rather neglected Zulu perspective. So what I want to do really this afternoon is first of all, for those of you who are perhaps not entirely familiar with the chronology, to give you a kind of just an overview of the war and is Andwana and Rourke's Drift. Then secondly, I want to look at the immediate impact of is Andwana and Rourke's Drift in this country in 1879. Then I'm going to say a little bit about the slightly longer term uh, uh, cultural impact, you could argue, in Britain in the 1880s. But then I will turn to the revival of interest in the 1960s. And then lastly, I'll talk about how our interpretation of the war has changed since the 1960s. So let me begin then with a kind of a, an overview of the war. Uh, the context is really British concern for imperial security. Uh, the Cape had been annexed by Britain in 1806 because it's on the route to India. And then in 1845, Britain had a next Natal to keep it really to keep the coast out of the hands of Afrikaners who had trekked away from British rule at the Cape and had founded their own two republics in the interior, uh, the Orange Free State and the Transvaal. Now, as the sort of the Europeans are, are moving north, uh, so African peoples, Bantu peoples were moving southwards. And within the Bantu, there was a subdivision called the Nguni. And within the Nguni, there was a subdivision, a clan called the Zulu. And they really um, were transformed into this formidable military power uh, by their chief Shaka between 1817 and 1828. Now, the British government at the time wanted to sort of end what it saw as the kind of the political fragmentation of the European colonies in South Africa, and at the same time to reduce the power of independent African kingdoms. Uh, so it's primarily about security, but there are some economic imperatives as well. Uh, Natal is very much seen as a sort of a gateway uh, for European goods into the interior, and Africans are certainly seen as a sort of cheap labor. The conservative government at the time uh, pursued a policy it called confederation of the white colonies. And that was very much advanced in 1877 by the annexation of the Transvaal, which had bankrupted itself in a war against another um, African people, the Papidi. When Britain annexed the Transvaal, it inherited a border dispute between the Transvaal and the Zulus. And the British High Commissioner uh, at the Cape, uh, Sir Henry Bartle Frere, thought that he might be able to exploit that border uh, dispute in order to bring about a war with the Zulus, because he very much um, uh, sort of characterizes Keshweo, the Zulu king, as leading, as he put it, uh, an army of 40,000 uh, celibate man-slaying gladiators. Well, unfortunately for Frere, uh, a border commission uh, found in favor of the Zulus on this disputed frontier between the uh, Zululand and the Transvaal. But Frere was then able to manipulate uh, promises that had been extracted from the Zulu king, Keshweo, 
back in 1873 for the future, his future good conduct. And therefore, on the 11th, after some border incidents uh, in the course of 1878, Frere issued an ultimatum uh, to Keshweo on the 11th of December 1878, uh, uh, demanding really the, um, that the whole of the Zulu military system be dismantled. And that military system actually underlined or the, the whole Zulu polity. Frere did not send that ultimatum immediately to London. Uh, he wanted it to arrive too late to prevent a war because the British government is already fighting a war in Afghanistan. It didn't want to fight another one in South Africa. Well, no uh, satisfactory reply was received to that ultimatum. And therefore, on the 11th of January 1879, uh, three British columns uh, invaded Zululand under the overall command of a man who very much shared Frere's view of the threat posed by the Zulus, and this was Lieutenant General Lord Chelmsford. Well, the timing of the invasion uh, is actually very, is very well timed, because this is the moment when the Zulus would normally be gathering in their harvest, and the rivers would be relatively high, and that would perhaps impede Zulu incursions into uh, Natal. Uh, Chelmsford, I think, um, understood that Keshweo could not keep his army in the field for very long. Therefore, they would be drawn into an open battle and pretty much then British firepower would do the rest. And I think the problem was in a way that Chelmsford either did not believe what he read or what he was told about Zulu military capabilities. And he chose to join the main column uh, number three column, which was going to advance from Rourke's Drift on the frontier uh, of Zululand towards the main, uh, Keshweo's main homestead, which was at uh, Yolundi. Well, on the morning of the 22nd of January, Chelmsford divided his command and he took most of it out uh, from the camp that had now been established at Isandwana in order uh, to tackle what he thought appeared to be the main Zulu army, which had been spotted somewhere off to the south of the camp. And he left at his Andwana uh, approximately 1,700 men. Uh, that number included uh, number two column, which arrived at the camp in the middle of the morning under the command of Colonel Anthony Durnford. And throughout the day, uh, Chelmsford ignored the reports that were reaching him that the camp was under attack. And of course, as we know, somewhere between 20 and 24,000 Zulus overwhelmed the camp at Isandwana. It was the largest single day's loss of British lives, British military lives, between 1815 and 1914. 858 Europeans were killed, uh, 710 of them were British regular troops, uh, primarily drawn from five companies of the 1st Battalion of the 24th Foot and one company of the 2nd Battalion of the 24th. In addition, about 470 or so native auxiliaries from the Natal native contingent were also uh, killed. The Zulus uh, probably lost around about a thousand dead. Uh, Addis Andwana. And it has to be said that you know, the, it's, it's not part of the warrior ethos of the Zulus to use firearms. They, get, they want to get to close combat. They had never actually experienced firepower like this. And it says a great deal of their tenacity that they were able uh, to, to overwhelm, uh, overwhelm the camp. Well, a portion of the Zulu reserve, somewhere between three and 4,000 men, then swept on to the mission station, which had been established as a base, a depot, a hospital at Rourke's Drift. Rourke's Drift was defended by about 139 men, some of them hospital patients. The majority of them drawn from B Company of the uh, 2nd Battalion of the 24th, the whole under the command of Lieutenant John Chard, and the 24th under the command of Lieutenant Gonville Bromhead. And over the next 10 hours or so, so into the 23rd of January, they were able to stave off that Zulu uh, attack 
and they lost just 17 dead. And the Zulus probably lost in the region of 600 dead at Rourke's Drift. Clearly, Rourke's Drift went a long way to restoring uh, British pride after the disaster earlier that day at Addis Andwana. But clearly, it meant that there could be no swift end to the war. On the same day as Rourke's Drift uh, uh, and Isandwana, uh, number one column down on the coast uh, fought off a, a small Zulu force at a place called Nazani, but was then besieged at Ashawi. And it wasn't until April that Chelmsford was able to relieve the siege of Ashawi and again fighting a small battle at Gingad Lovu in order to do so. Up in the north, uh, number four column. Uh, got quite badly beaten in what was really kind of extended cattle raid on the mountain of Slaban on the 28th of March, 1879. But the following day, the main Zulu army, that army which had won at Isandwana, attacked the camp of number four column at Kambula and was repulsed again with heavy losses on the 29th of uh, uh, March. Reinforcements arrived from England, uh, Chelmsford was able to mount another invasion of Zululand in May. And finally, the Zulus were brought to defeat uh, at Yalundi on the 4th of July. And that, to some extent, retrieved Chelmsford's reputation because Sir Garnet Wolseley had already arrived in South Africa in order to supersede him. And it was Wolseley who then captured Keshweo on the 28th of August. And it was Wolseley who imposed a settlement on Zululand, which divided it into 13 separate segments under reliable chiefs. Uh, Keshweya was exiled. The settlement unraveled very quickly. There was civil war in Zululand amongst these chiefs. Uh, Keshweya was allowed back to a portion of his kingdom in 1883, but he died in 1884. And such was the chaos that Britain then annexed Zululand in 1887. So that then is, is the broad uh, chronology. So let, them, let me then turn now to the immediate impact of Isandwana and Rourke's Drift in Britain in 1879. Well, of course, Europeans are not actually meant to lose against indigenous opponents. It, has, it is actually relatively rare. So therefore that makes the shock all the greater. The news did not reach London until the, early, the first few minutes of the 11th of February. And there's this report from a reporter of the, uh, the Western Morning News uh, from Bristol, uh, reporting back uh, to his newspaper about the mood in London uh, that morning, the 11th of February. The capital was struggling between deep depression and high excitement. Evidence of this depression was palpable enough in the railway trains this morning. Nobody cared to talk. Evidence of the excitement is palpable enough in the streets this afternoon. The papers are selling wildly and little knots of men are to be found in sheltered corners discussing the news. Well, um, uh, if you don't have a national newspaper, then it may take a day or two for you to hear the events. So down here, in fact, in Penzance, you, know, you didn't read about it until the Cornishman appeared on the 13th of February. Um, the ritual disemboweling of the British dead at Isandwana very mu much added to the shock of events. And as in some other colonial campaigns where there were these kind of perceived atrocities uh, uh, against the British troops or, or British civilians, then that in a sense was a rationalization for rest retribution. And there was such retribution at Rourke's Drift, uh, at Kambula, uh, and at Yolundi. But at the same time, that in a sense, you are um, you, you're seeing your opponents uh, as savage and deserving a retribution. There's, some, there's this new respect if they prove themselves to be worthy opponents. And the attitudes towards the Zulu transform overnight. So Queen Victoria very quickly proclaims that the Zulus are the finest and bravest race in South Africa. And there's an editorial in the Times on the 21st of February. 
We have often before encountered barbarian enemies, but seldom enemies who united ferocity of barbarism with the discipline and unity which have been supposed to be characteristics of civilization. Well, there has to be some kind of explanation too as to why this had ended up as a British defeat when everybody had expected it to be a pretty easy victory. And almost, almost quite quickly really, and, and it, it's enshrined in a official history that was published in 1881. First of all, there was a failure, uh, it is said, to lager the wagons, uh, to draw the wagons in uh, to a kind of a tighter uh, defensive perimeter, it is Andwana. Secondly, it is suggested that the Natal native contingent gave way at a very crucial moment, and that allowed the Zulus to get through uh, the British defence. Thirdly, it is suggested that Anthony Durnford, who had become the senior officer when he arrived with number two column mid-morning, should have stayed in the camp and defended it. He should not have then taken off much of number two column across the plain. Uh, where, uh, because he, he, again, they're seeing Zulus in the distance, he thought they might be attacking Chelmsford in the rear, he leads his men off across the plain, and they have to kind of stage a fighting retreat uh, back uh, to uh, the camp. And it's also suggested a little bit later that the ammunition supply failed on the firing line, they ran out of ammunition. Well, the truth in the sense is that the firing line at Isandwana uh, was too far out, it was too extended, there were too few men in it, and it was therefore relatively easy for the Zulus to outflank the defence. In fact, there is no contemporary evidence, either that the collapse of the Natal native contingent precipitated the general wider collapse, nor is there any contemporary evidence that they ran out of ammunition on the firing line. Now, of course, by contrast, later that day and into the following day at Rourke's Drift, the defense held. And this is, first of all, uh, the Zulus arrived piecemeal. Secondly, they, the reserve of Dizandwana were older men. The Zulu army is constructed in age regiments. And it's the older men in the reserve, and pretty much by the time they'd run pretty much all the way from his Andwana to Rourke's Drift, they were exhausted. Also, of course, there are improvised defences, and that was enough. And now I think you can make out, I hope, in the top left hand uh, picture, there is around part of the perimeter uh, of Rourke's Drift a kind of a rocky outcrop. And once you've sort of piled biscuit boxes and mealy bags on top of that, then that gives you much greater advantage. And in fact, a bayonet on the end of a Martini Henry rifle has a longer reach than the Zulu Asagai. So they were able, therefore, to defend the post. Now, equally, of course, if you are according your opponents um, uh, the respect because uh, you, you, they are worthy of you, then that heightens your gallantry in overcoming them. Uh, I think the last stands already pretty much a motif of British character by this time. And therefore the defense of Rourke's Drift very much obscures the magnitude of the defeat at Isandwana. But in Britain, perhaps rather than in South Africa. Wolseley, for example, uh, when he arrives in May, uh, noted rather sourly of the defense of Rourke's Drift, the defenders had no recourse but to fight like rats for their lives, which they could not otherwise save. And that's the general reaction in South Africa. So for example, there is a, a prominent staff officer, a man called Francis Clary, and he writes in May, until the accounts came out from England, nobody had thought of the Rourke's Drift affair, except as one, in which the private soldiers of the 24th behaved so well. Or again, arriving with reinforcements in May, uh, Colonel Philip Anstruther writes that too much is made of Rourke's Drift in Britain because they were fighting for their lives and could not have done anything else. Well, of course, 11 Victoria Crosses are awarded for the defense of Rourke's Drift. And there is very much a campaign for the VC to be awarded others involved at Rourke's Drift, or indeed occasionally it is Andwana. 
including Lieutenants Melville and Corgill, uh, Melville carrying uh, the Queen's colour of the 124 foot from the battlefield of Isandrana, but both Melville and Corgill killed, uh, caught and killed at Pugetis, what became known as Pugetis Drift. But in fact, they could not be awarded the VC because the statutes then did not allow for posthumous awards. And they had to wait until the statutes were changed and they didn't get the VC, in fact, until 1907. So very clearly then, is Andwana and Rorke's Drift have quite an, Im an immediate impact in this country. But there's also a kind of, for a few years anyway, a kind of a cultural impact of events as well. So now let me turn to the sort of cultural uh, resonances, if you like, of what had happened. I think by 1879, uh, the British public was in fact increasingly literate. Certainly the price of newspapers, the price of periodicals had come down. It was within the reach of many more people if they chose to, 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 to read them. And this is also really the period at the very beginning of what you could call the great imperial adventure. And because of the uh, sort of the, the, the extension, the, the various ways in which the media is being expanded at the time, there are many more ways by what, which that imperial adventure uh, can be advertised and indeed exploited. And this war actually gets far more coverage than the ongoing war in Afghanistan for a very particular reason. There is a direct link by telegraph, either on land or submarine cable between London and India. News from Afghanistan arrives almost instantaneously. The nearest a submarine cable gets to South Africa in 1879 is Madeira. And between Madeira and the Cape, everything has to go by steamer. So in effect, even if you send a telegram from Cape Town, and of course it's taken some days to get there from Natal, uh, it's going to take at least 20 days before it reaches London, because it's then of course has to go up by ship uh, to Madeira and then it's telegraphed to London. Um, the war was already controversial. Uh, the press had very much divided on partisan lines, uh, but even the liberal press had expected an easy victory, so the news is absolutely stunning. And in a way, in this country, the debate about what had gone wrong at Isandwana eclipses in the longer term the, the, the sort of the story of Rourke's Drift, because there is no more news from South Africa for weeks, not until March, does anything more actually happen out there. So there's always that, that time lag that takes place. Although certainly the press are very keen to have stories of those who may or may not uh, be survivors of Rizandwana or may or may not be survivors of Rourke's Drift. Uh, because if you can have the story of a local man, that gives a great deal more immediacy, of course, to, to the coverage. Cartoonists uh, have to tread a, a rather careful line uh, because of the, the, the number of dead at Isandwana. So there is this very famous cartoon by Tenniel in Punch on the 1st of March, and you've got this Zulu uh, drawing, despise not your enemy, on a blackboard for John Bull. Over on the right there, um, this is October, so the war is now over for some months. So now the Zulu is a plucky little fellow who certainly could not have hoped to win, but it didn't look like that back in February when the news first arrives in Britain. Um, again, Punch in April uh, produced uh, a new chapter, as it called it, for a pamphlet that Chelmsford had issued to his troops just before the invasion, on how to fight the Zulus. And according to Punch, the new chapter should be headed, how to ensure a defeat. And one of the suggestions, knowing that a strongly fortified camp is the key and nucleus of defense against a vigilant and active enemy, the CO should move off quietly with the bulk of his force, leaving the tents untrenched and the wagons unparked. And again, in another satirical magazine at the time, there's a letter allegedly from Frere asking that all the reinforcements going out to South Africa should be single men because there is something to be said for a force of celibate man-slaying gladiators after all. 
The conservative press attack the partisanship of the liberal press, but they do not defend Chelmsford or Frere. And again, a little dictum that goes the rounds at the time, a sort of parody, a parody of Caesar, Chelmsford dictum should be, I went, I did not see, I suffered a defeat. Well, we're talking about Victorian England. So as you can imagine, there's a, very, a great deal of very, very bad poetry about his Andwather and Rorke's Drift. Uh, the Gallant 24th is, is a fairly common theme. Uh, there's a lot of classical allusion, particularly to Thermopylae. Um, uh, Melvin and Coggill uh, uh, are eulogized. But there's also actually a rather nice poem by William McGonagall. And this is about Henry Hook, uh, the hero of Rourke's Drift. Methinks I see the noble hero, Henry Hook, because like a destroying angel, he did look. As he stood at the hospital entrance, defending the patients there, bayoneting the Zulus while their cries rent the air. As they strove hard the hospital to enter in, he murdered them in scores and thought it no sin. Well, you know, it does actually rhyme. I guess music in its different forms is very much the, um, the, the soundtrack of empire. And you're getting a lot of sheet music like this again, Gallant 24th and so on. But in fact, music hall is the most popular um, most patriotic form of music in the country. And some of you, you may have heard of a song called By Jingo, which is uh, about the Russian threat to Constantinople in 1878. And there's a new version about the Zulus in 1879. Lord Chelmsford is the man to skedaddle if he can and leave our men to be slaughtered by the Zulus. Even more ubiquitous, there are entertainments based on the war in this country. <coughs> Excuse me. As early as April, a group, uh, there is a, a show at what's called Astley's Amphitheatre in London, the Kaffa War. And this apparently has Zulu hosts contending against British troops. Now, in fact, these are whites blacked up. But it's not actually long before a sort of genuine Zulus begin to appear on the London and provincial stages. Uh, a group appeared at Brecon uh, in April of 1879, and they were then brought to the Royal Aquarium in London uh, by a former Canadian high wire walker who went by the name of the Great Farini. And he'd acquired them from the Follies Bergere in Paris, and he recruited more from South Africa. And uh, Farini's friendly Zulus became a sensation on the London stage. And again, there's a musical song, Go and See the Zulus. I'm very glad I took my wife to see these wondrous men. And she was quite delighted too, but I was startled when she remarked would give her joy and true bliss without alloy, if we named our baby boy after all the friendly Zulus. Uh, again, you know, they, these shows are fairly common. Uh, Barnum, P.T. Barnum, offered the government $10,000 if they could exhibit Keshweo. Of course, that was refused. But at Aylesbury uh, in October uh, of 1879, you have Pinder's Continental Grand Hippodrome Circus, who uh, uh, exhibit a troop of Zulus who are supposedly refugees from the Zulu army, who have placed themselves under British protection rather than fight. Do not miss this opportunity of witnessing the representatives of our foes against whom our gallant forces fought so nobly is Isandwana and Ashawi. Uh, you go to Madame Tussauds, there you find a waxwork of Keshweo. Uh, I suppose one of the, the, the slightly more bizarre manifestations of, of this sudden interest in the Zulu is that there is what are called uh, Bruin, uh, sorry, uh, Brewers and Rollings original Zulus. And this, in fact, is a football team that uh, toured the north of England uh, and Scotland in the autumn of 1879. Uh, and according to the press reports, leaving their assegais and spears on the touchline. In fact, they are white players blacked up, nearly all of them from Sheffield Wednesday. And this rather aroused the anger of the Sheffield Football Association, 
because these were amateurs apparently taking payments for appearances, although in fact the profits went to war charities. But when football was finally professionalized in 1885, one of the very first teams were the Sheffield Rovers, and they were all the former Sheffield Zulus who'd been banned from playing back as the Sheffield, uh, the Rollings original Zulus. Again, you're getting lectures on the war throughout the country very quickly, uh, usually illustrated by what are called dioramic dissolving views illuminated by oxygen hydrogen line light, but we would call them magic lantern shows. So for example, uh, William North, uh, it later became part of North and Randall, some of you may remember, the mineral water manufacturer in Aylesbury, William North is touring his slideshow about Zulus in the autumn at Aylesbury, Missenden and Wadsden. And there's a firm of photographers at Leighton Buzzard, the Piggots, who are also touring a, a show through much of the county that autumn. Uh, another facet is that the Great Western Railway uh, uh, unveiled a new express uh, from Paddington to Plymouth in June of 1879, and it was called the Zulu Express. Uh, and I've looked at the timetable, and it looks actually marginally faster than the present service. Uh, there's a, an enterprising Aberdeen grocer. He's offering Rourke's Drift Relief Whiskey, 17 shillings a gallon. Uh, you can buy Zulu clay pipes, uh, Zulu oysters, Zulu antimacassars, uh, Zulu insect destroying powder, uh, later Zulu safety cycles and Zulu safety matches. Certainly in terms of the artistic response, then is Andouane and Rourke's Drift dominate the coverage of the war. Uh, the first version of Rourke's Drift uh, appeared uh, by a painter called Dugan in May. It was exhibited first in Leeds, and then uh, it uh, was bought by what was called Hamilton's Panorama and was toured around the country and often had a later a little talk uh, given by one of the Rorks Drift BCs, uh, William Jones. I suppose by far the best known painting of his Andwana is this one uh, by Charles Fripp. Uh, quite late, actually, it's one of the very last paintings of the war to uh, be uh, uh, painted. Uh, and it's one of the great treasures of the National Army Museum up in Chelsea. And then two very famous views of Rourke's Drift. Uh, this one, uh, commissioned by the Queen, uh, by the Army's favourite painter, uh, Lady Butler, uh, but wasn't actually critically acclaimed. And um, allegedly, uh, Lady Butler felt quite sick at the popularity of a slightly earlier version of Rourke's Drift, which was this one by the French military artist, Alphonse de Neuville, this commissioned by the Fine Arts Society. And this was so popular that it was bought by the New Art Gallery at Sydney in New South Wales, where it's still on display. And curiously enough, you're getting the same kind of responses to the war in Australia as you do in this country. Well, it's very fashionable at the moment to uh, pull down statues and rename things. There are quite a lot of roads, at least still, uh, named after uh, battles uh, of the war, particularly as Andorra and Rourke's Drift. If you look at the 1881 census, amongst the young, the newly born, uh, you will find Keshway O. Platt, George Keshway O. Burton, Robert Isandula Jarmason, Florinda Isandwana Barham, Charles Rourke's Drift Mariner, and Henry Charles Bromhead Gates. There's even some early tourism as well. I suppose though most of these kind of cultural responses that have gone really by the middle of the 1880s. And there are just two exceptions. One is that it lingers on in the canon of popular literature. So George Henty, of course, the famous writer for boys, uh, he wrote The Young Colonists, which combines the Zulu War and the anglo transfer War, that's published in 1885. Um, his natural successor was uh, Frederick Brereton, uh, was Shield and Assegai by Brereton, was published in 1900. And you can pretty much pick up any anthology, uh, Victorian, late Victorian anthology, 
of stories about battles of heroes, primarily written for boys, and Rourke's Drift will feature. And then for the adult market, Henry Ryder Haggard, and he also proclaims the Zulus as the finest savage race in the world. And there are two particular books in which the war uh, features. The second part of the trilogy uh, called The Witch's Head in 1884, and the last part of the trilogy finished in 1907. The other thing which has a slightly longer legacy is the Zulu scenes in tournaments, military tournaments, military reenactments. So, for example, at the uh, Royal Military Tournament in 1895, assegais hurtled through the air, Zulus chanted in savage chorus, machine guns rattled, and a flank attack by Zulus from beneath the royal box brought about a hand to hand fight which was intensely and strongly realistic. Or even as late as 1923, uh, one of the great order shot searchlight tattoos, there is a night attack by Zulus on a convoy of the time of the Zulu War. But this attack uh, results in the emergence of tanks, aircraft and armor cars, by the aid of which the tables are turned on the attacking hordes who are scattered seeking cover in the woods, as indeed well they might. But really, primarily other than in literature, other than military enactment, interest is gone by the middle of the 1880s. Other events have intervened, the war in Afghanistan, the Anglo-Transfer War, uh, the occupation of Egypt, Gordon at Khartoum, and so on. And you've just got this brief flurry of interest in the 1930s, a book uh, by a man called Clements, uh, attacking Chelmsford's conduct of the war in 1936, riposte uh, by uh, Gerald French in 1939, defending Chelmsford, and then a little book in, about his Andwana in 1948, by a man called Reginald Coupland, which is just a, a really a summary of the official history. But other than that, there is no real interest in the war until the 1960s. So let's then turn to the 60s. First to Donald Morris. Morris was an American naval officer uh, who, at the time he wrote The Washington Spears, uh, was working for the CIA in Berlin. And he was persuaded by Ernest Hemingway that there was no readable account of the war. It's very much uh, a product of its time. So for example, Morris says that the cause of the war is that the Zulu kingdom's irresponsible power posed a considerable threat to the continued existence of European civilization in its vicinity. It's very well written and it's been very, very influential. So this particular, uh, uh, passage famously de de describing how the Zulu army, the Zulu impi was discovered on the morning of the 22nd of January. And it features indeed uh, in uh, the film Zulu Dawn. And Morris very much emphasizes the failure of the ammunition supply at his Andwana as the cause of the defeat. By the time Morris died in 2002, this book had appeared in 17 languages, it had sold over 200,000 copies. And in the words of a very distinguished South African historian, John LeBand, something was brought into being with an indestructible will of its own and has marched remorselessly on, never once out of print. But it was another writer, popular writer, John Preble, uh, whose little short story on Rourke's Drift in Lilliput magazine in 1958 led directly to Zulu, and Preble worked on the script and the screenplay with the producer, uh, Cy Endfield. It's not the first film about the war. There had been a silent black and white South African film about the war in 1918. But of course, it is Zulu in 1964 that has this enormous impact. It's pretty stereotypical in many respects, but it also has these myths that it creates of its own. So there is indeed you know, the Zulu salute to brave men at the end, which did not happen. There's a singing of men of Harlech, which did not happen. There is this idea of the Welshness of the 24th foot. 
Now, certainly, uh, it, you know, the, the, it's at the time, it's a second Warwickshire regiment. It did not become the South Wales borderers until 1881. Although to be fair, the depot was established at Brecon in 1873. But at most of 139 defenders, 27 were Welsh. And that includes 60 men who technically are English because they come from the Monmouthshire, which was then an English county. And certainly one historian claims there's only five genuine Welshmen at Rorke's Drift. Uh, there are actually 13 Irishmen. It's, um, there's a great deal that you know, made this film popular, the epic nature, uh, the scenery, it's not, it's not filmed in Zululand. It was filmed at the Royal Natal National Park in Drakensbergs. Uh, there's the opening and ending narration by Richard Burton. There's that wonderful musical score by John Barry. And there's the seeming hordes of Zulus. In fact, there are only 240 Zulu extras. And when you sort of see them arrayed up on the hillside, what you're actually seeing is a genuine Zulu at the end of a very long pole and shields stuck on the pole between them. Um, by 1989, it had grossed $10 million. And in all the kind of uh, polls that have been done uh, on you know, fa favorite films, is always featured very highly. So for example, 60,000 viewers of a television satellite uh, service in a millennium poll uh, put Zulu as the second highest placed British film 18th overall. Channel 4's 100 Greatest War Films in 2005, Zulu comes in eighth. Uh, in a poll of uh, the favorite uh, films of conservative MPs, Zulu came first in 2004. And in 2008, the British Forces Broadcasting Service proclaimed that Zulu was the, 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 the most popular film of all time amongst British servicemen. I think there's also more to it than that. It, it's, it's a film that owes, I think, also a lot to its hybrid nature. On the one hand, it looks back to those great imperial epics of Alexander Corda, the drum, uh, the four feathers before the war, before the Second World War. On the other hand, it's looking forward to the kind of anti-war rhetoric of the 60s. There's some anti-anachronistic lip service to uh, anti-war rhetoric. There's this alleged class antagonism between Charles and Bromhead, which of course is not the case at all. Um, Henry Hook's um, family were appalled by his, uh, his depiction as a kind of a 60s rebel. Uh, the real Henry Hook was a teetotaler uh, who ended up uh, as a very respected guard at the British Museum. And certainly academic critics have very much increasingly condemned it uh, because they're, they're uncomfortable with what they see as ambivalence towards imperial themes. But of course, this cuts no ice with the public whatsoever. There was an earlier, there was then a prequel, which was Lulu Dawn in 1979, which when you analyze it carefully, is actually pretty vividly anti-militarist. John Mills appears as Frere and wants a final solution to the Zulu problem. Uh, Peter O'Toole's arrogant Chelmsford is undone by Zulu cunning. Uh, the script is very much based on Morris. Again, it's by Cy Enfield, this time with Anthony Story. And it's very much uh, em this emphasis on the failure of the ammunition supply uh, that, that is stressed. And there's been some pretty detailed criticism of it, rather like Zulu. At least it is actually shot in Zululand. So up there in the top left, uh, be, uh, behind Bob Hoskins, you've got Sipezi, which is a mountain which is about two miles from Isandwana. And at the bottom there, uh, the uh, British invasion is indeed crossing the Buffalo at Rourke's Drift. Uh, the only problem is that for technical reasons, we are invading Natal from Zululand and not vice versa. Um, it's not as good a film it didn't chime with the audience. And rather interestingly, uh, an American critic has since written, given the political climate of the audience at the time the films were made, Zulu Dawn could not have been made in 1964 and Zulu could not have been made in 1979. And that I think is an interesting point. 
So there's a lot of political correctness about Zulu Dawn. And yet, certainly from the perspective of the white characters, there's still a Zulu horde out there. And rather curiously, the director was a man called Douglas Hickox, on the one hand said that he equated the British invasion of Zululand with Hitler's invasion of Poland. On the other hand, he said he saw the Zulus as a sea of black, as African ants. It seems to be a sort of a disconnect there. But together, and certainly Zulu has this enormous influence, I think, in reviving interest in the war. So now let me lastly turn to the way our interpretation has changed since the 60s. And I think inspired by Zulu or otherwise, uh, new generations or new generations of, of historians, both academic and non-academic, have done a great deal to revisit the war. And there are enduring controversies. So Vizanduana, um, <coughs> excuse me, where was the Zulu bivouac on the morning of the 22nd of January? Where precisely and in what circumstances was it discovered? Did the Zulus intend to attack that day? Did they intentionally deceive Chelmsford into dividing his force? Uh, what is the role of the ammunition boxes in the collapse? What is the real reason for the defeat at Isandwana and so on? Or at Rourke's Drift, what were the true state of defenses at Rourke's Drift? Did the Zulus use Martini Henry's, they captured it is Andwana uh, to fire down on, on, on the troops. Uh, who actually wrote Chard's re first report on the action? Why are there discrepancies between his first and his second reports on the action? Uh, even more, more recently, there's been a fairly trivial debate on the exact configuration of the rooms within the hospital at Rourke's Drift, which is pretty minor in many ways. But no, this is what people have become interested in. But I think above all, since the 60s, we have taken much more notice of the Zulu perspective. Now, of course, Zulu accounts were taken down at the time, uh, but they're, uh, they're always in the sense filtered through a mediator, through an interpreter. And those who interviewed Zulus were mostly interested in the deaths of particular white officers, Dernford, for example, Pulain. Uh, even if you look at the modern war memorials, which have been put up to the Zulus, Addis Andwana and Rourke's Drift, they're much more Western than they are uh, African in their conception uh, and their sort of meaning. The Zulus don't have a written history, they have an oral history. There are some depictions of the war on cattle horns, Again, there's dispute as to whether or not these are by Zulu artists. And there's a very different kind of interpretation of Isandwana in particular in South Africa to Britain. I suppose in this country, Rourke's Drift has become a kind of a metaphor. Uh, so for example, uh, when England faced a crucial World Cup qualifying match, football match against Italy uh, back in 1997, the Times suggested whether it is Agincourt, Rourke's Drift, Dunkirk or the football field, the English remain level-headed in the face of adversity, masters of the tight squeeze. Well, in fact, we lost 1-0. Or the Bristol Post in 2014 suggested as an unbeaten century by the Gloucestershire batsman Ian Cockburn would have met the approval of Lieutenant John Chard. But within South Africa, uh, particularly is Andwana, the question and the meaning of the Zulu past and indeed Zulu identity is very much contested. One version of the Zulu past is that associated with chief now Prince Butelezi. And famously, Butelezi played his own maternal great grandfather, uh, Keshweo, in Zulu in 1964. They asked him to reprise the role in 79. He declined because he was then very heavily involved in politics. He founded the Encarta Freedom Party in 1975. And although it's not quite as uh, influential as it was, certainly in 1979, Encarta played a very significant role in the centenary commemoration of Isandwana and Rourke's Drift. 
he, Bujalese, is not always seen eye to eye with his cousin, uh, could, King, could oh, excuse me, yeah, put different teeth in, uh, King Goodwill. But together, undoubtedly, they have overseen a commercialization of the Zulu heritage with the intention of promoting Zulu nationalism. Back in 1992, at the time when the African National Congress was beginning to talk to the then white South African government, uh, and there was a lot of violence in what had become KwaZulu-Natal between Inkata and the ANC, Boutilese used that year's ceremony, it is Andwana, to say this, there was no new South Africa before the 19th century without having to deal with the Zulu reality. There will be no new South Africa in the last decade of the 20th century without dealing with the Zulu reality. And quite often, um, repeatedly, Bujalese has said that Zulu was a notable piece of PR for the Zulu nation. Uh, back in July of 2018, there was going to be a charity screening for service charities of Zulu in Folkestone. And this was condemned by some as perpetuating racism. And Boutilese was asked for his view. And he said this, the deep respect that develops between the warring armies and the nobility of Keshweo's warriors as they salute the enemy demanded a different way of thinking from the average viewer at the time of the film's release. Indeed, it remains a film that demands a thoughtful response. Whenever that past is remembered, it should always be a celebration of our ongoing fight and victory against division. That is worth thinking about as that is a present day context of the film Zulu. Okay, well, let me then draw this to a brief conclusion. The Anglo-Zulu war then very much now, I think, uh, has multiple meanings in Britain and South Africa. Again, in this country, back in January of 2018, there was some controversy because uh, Transport for London uh, ordered removed from a whiteboard at Collis Hill tube station, a simple uh, statement saying that this, the 22nd of January, was the anniversary of Isandwana and Rock's Drift, because one or other passengers suggested that it was celebrating colonialism. So in a way, you know, I said it's slightly different in the two different countries, but in this country, I think is Andwana and Rourke's Drift endure in a very particular way in British popular memory. But the question is, would that be so without Zulu in 1964? Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Professor Beckett. That was wonderful. Um, I'm just trying to get my screen to show. Oh, there we are. Let's have a look. Perhaps I need to view my screen. Could you stop sharing? Ah, oh, that's great. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's wonderful. Um, yes, fantastic. I um, just to make a comment. Um, I um, was really quite surprised by the uh, British attitude after um, uh, Rourke's drift and, and, of, and of the defeat, rather, I should say, um, of the British by the Zulus. Um, it was almost as if they had to sort of justify that defeat by glorifying this, the mm -hmm. Zulu as this, you know, yeah. only, only a glorified person could possibly have defeated the British. Yeah. <laughs> No, I mean, that, that is generally true. I mean, you, you get very similar kinds of, um, of situation elsewhere. Um, for example, in the, um, in, the, the new, in the Maori Wars, the New Zealand Wars, um, the Maoris um, um, have, in effect, entrenchments. I mean, bizarrely, some historians claim that the, the Maoris invented trench warfare. It's not at all true. Um, but um, we had a great, the British had a great deal of difficulty breaking into some of these entrenchments. And it was suggested, for example, uh, that um, the Maoris must, the, a British deserter, you know, British deserters must have instructed the Maori uh, in, in, in digging entrenchments, that kind of thing. So it's not at all uncommon. If, yeah. there's a if there's a defeat, there has to be an explanation which is related uh, to some very special circumstance. 
Yes, I was I was surprised that Queen Victoria sort of said oh, they yeah. were the bravest, yeah. you know, savages yeah. in Africa. I found that amazing. Well, you see, um, that I showed that portrait she had commissioned. Mm -hmm. uh, Keshweo came to London uh, in 1882 in order to try and get support for being reinstated. And uh, he, he, he met the Queen uh, and she was greatly taken by him and indeed had that, uh, gave him a gift. I can't remember off hand what she gave him, a cup or a silver cup or something like that, but had that portrait um, specially commissioned by Carl Sohn. And Keshwayo himself was sent to the Victoria and Albert Museum and Woolwich Arsenal and uh, it became, became a celebrity uh, because crowds you know, were coming to see him outside. He was living in a, a house in Kensington and there were great crowds uh, gathering outside this to see him in the, sort of the window. Yes, yes, thank you. I shall now ask if anyone else has a, a question that they would like to ask, if they would care to unmute themselves. Um, I won't unmute everyone because uh, we tend to get a bit of background noise there. Is there anyone who, I can't see everyone here, so I'll have to go and have a look. Or perhaps I will unmute everyone, see what happens. Yes, no? I can't see everyone. <laughs> Mike is talking, but I'll have to, he'll have to unmute himself, I think. Or I'll have to unmute everyone somehow. Ooh, how can I unmute everyone? No. Um, normally the individual should be able I to... I think it's the individual. You'll have yeah, to unmute. Yeah. There we are. Mike's unmuted himself. <laughs> oh, and he's muted himself again. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, anyone else got a question? They will have to unmute themselves because I am unable to do it. Oh dear, a silence. I must be all stunned. <laughs> must be all stunned. Okay, well, thank you very much if there's no questions. Um, I enjoyed that very much. Can you hear me now, Claire? I can indeed, Mike. I could see you uh, talking and I couldn't, yeah. I couldn't unmute you. Yeah, thank you, thank you. As you know, I'm totally illiterate when it comes to this this technology of yours. Um, I finally pressed the right button. Um, <laughs> I'd just like to comment really on one 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 uh, question with with Ian. Um, you mentioned uh, on the Battle of Azanwana that um, uh, we know that 1,300 or so uh, were killed on the British side. Yeah. Uh, you, I think, said about a thousand Zulus were killed. Yeah. Um, I, I, I wondered whether you thought, uh, why you thought that the, the, the deaths of the Zulus was less, significantly less than that of the British, particularly in view of the way, whilst the camp wasn't entrenched, as you pointed out, um, the, the, the firepower of the, the, the British army with their, with their rifles and <clears throat> rifles were not uh, well used by the Zulu at that time, at that yeah. battle, um, that the deaths of the Zulu would not be higher. And there's no oh, evidence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there any evidence to show that, in fact, you, if you like, the figure you're suggesting is in the right order? Yeah, well, I mean, it, 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 you cannot be precise about uh, the number of Zulu dead. Um, they tended, if they could, to drag off their dead. Um, for example, the Dizandwana, um, a lot of them were buried in ant bear pits. Um, we think uh, that about 6,000 Zulus are killed in the course of the war as a whole. And certainly uh, around, around 1,000 are killed at Dizandwana. Um, now, the, the point about it, about you know, 1,700 defenders, is that not, not all of them are British regulars, about 710 are British regulars. Uh, a lot of them are native, uh, sorry, I, apart from the native Natal native contingent, others are colonial volunteers of one kind or another. Um, what we now believe uh, is that, again, this is a result of, of very carefully going through a lot of records, is that of the, those men, relatively few were actually in the firing line because um, an order came back from Chelmsford mid-morning to pack up the camp 
uh, to come on and join him uh, where he'd gone off to the south with the rest of the men. And the idea was that they would then move on uh, towards Yolandi. And it's now believed uh, from some of the evidence that you can tease out of the accounts and so on, that probably around uh, half the men were actually packing up the camp and you know, they're not out on the firing line. So uh, you know, the volume of fire that is being put down uh, is um, not as great as one might suppose. Now, had they all pulled back into the camp and sort of stood in serried ranks behind a wagon, then that might have been a very different affair. But you know, we are talking about 20,000 Zulus who, who get around the back of his Andwana, they get around the flanks, uh, and uh, they, they just simply overwhelm that defence. Uh, there, there is a, uh, the account suggests that until quite late on, uh, there is, they're kept at bay by uh, the British fire. And when, they, when it's seen that Durnford's group out on the plain are being outflanked, Pelain, who was the man who commanded the camp, uh, so sounded the bugles to retire and that's when it all goes wrong because the Zulus are quicker than the British at getting back into the camp um, so a th you know a thousand dead is a very heavy uh, mm. casualty bill for the Zulus they, as I said they had never experienced this kind of fire before um, uh, and uh, comparable again at Kambula they, they lose around about a thousand dead it, uh, and that you're Lundy about the same. So it, it's, that's, it's that sort of similar magnitude, even when there is concentrated fire as at Kambula and, and at your Thank you. Uh, anyone else got any questions? Um, just one for another thing, comment by me. Um, I was interested in the comment that the film made in 1964 would not be made in 1979 and vice versa. I'm just wondering what the film would be like if one was made today. <laughs> yes, well, well yes, uh, yeah, it's very different indeed, I suspect. Yes, I was just thinking yes. about that. Yeah, absolutely, um, yeah. Oh, sorry, uh, Eddie has a question here. I wonder, could I just raise a, a general question, not specific to the Zulu Wars, mm, but sure. Uh, specific really to Africa. When you read the history, certainly of the second half of the 19th century, um, and how the European powers were just carving, off Af uh, carving up Africa mm. into spheres of influence, yeah. I'm very interested in the, if you like, the philosophy and almost the religion that we had a divine right Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. to those parts of Africa. Yeah. Nobody thought, as I recall it, that it was stealing. In fact, probably not the opposite. We felt that we had a, you know, a missionary, if yeah, I'm yeah. Skipping, we had a yeah. missionary duty to help. But That's equally, right, yeah. um, no, no one gave very much thought to the right of the indigenous African to their own territory, as I see it. I wonder if you could comment on that. No, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, um, I mean, imperialism has many um, sort of roots. Uh, one, one of which is, is, is certainly security. Another is commercial. Uh, a third is indeed religion. Uh, and the idea of the missionary, uh, the mission uh, to civilize. Uh, it depends. It, it differs. I think the actual the, the strength of one motive or another differs from one country, from one state to another. I mean, the Germans, for example, um, by the time they get involved, it's because everybody else is already involved, and yes. they want their bit as well. Um, I think, to, to a very large extent, um, the British do see it as a civilizing mission. Um, uh, but you know, so there, there is, I mean, the Belgians too, uh, uh, the, excuse me, the Belgian Congo, that's pretty much about commercialism. Mm. Um, so it, it's, it's a mixture of, of motive, excuse me, it's a mixture of motivations which, which uh, drives imperialism. But it, 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 there is an ideology of imperialism, um, just as there is of, of, of you know, liberalism or conservatism or whatever. Um, and it's very much associated um, with a sort of the imperial mission and service. Um, you know, a lot of the civil servants who go out, the colonial service people, the soldiers, 
uh, they, they do very much see it um, as certainly officers anyway, do very much see it uh, as, as a mission to civilize. Mm. Yeah, fine. Thing. Was there any criticism at the time? Oh, of, yes. Of our imperial ambitions? Oh yes, I mean, uh, as I suggested, I mean the the, the Zulu War is is is, is somewhat contentious mm. uh, because certainly the liberal press uh, attack uh, the, the the war as a whole. Um, so they they expect they too had expected an easy victory, but they condemn the war. And uh, there is um, uh, there's a man called Bishop Colenso. Uh, Colenso was um, uh, was the Bishop of Natal. And uh, Colenso is very much against the war. Uh, though interesting enough, um, missionaries in in Zululand were one of the drivers behind the war uh, because um, they had been expelled from Zululand by Keshweo. Uh, they had been uh, encouraged to go into Zululand by his predecessor, his father. Keshweo took against them. And the missionaries in in, uh, in Zululand were very much in favour of the war. Uh, but in this country, you'll get, I mean, the Methodists are interesting because there are Methodist, there are Methodist missionaries who oppose the, who are in favour of the war in South Africa, but the Methodist church in Britain opposes the war. Um, uh, Colenso was very active in opposing the war in this country and sending various messages back to supporters. Uh, there was the anti, um, uh, what they actually call themselves, um, the, the Peace Society uh, was against the war. There was uh, an anti, there was an Aboriginal, a, something Aboriginal society, which was against the war, um, who had been you know, 30, 40 years before involved in the, um, uh, the uh, abolition of the slave trade. So there is a lot of opposition to the war in this country. Uh, because it is perceived that the invasion was unjustified and there was this idea that indeed Frere had indeed manipulated uh, the situation to bring about a war, uh, which he justified on the grounds of the military threat posed by the Zulus to Natal. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, are there any other questions? Um, I'm madly looking at my screen here. Wave at me furiously if you didn't have one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, well, thank you very much, Ian. That was that was great. I'm sure we'll all be rushing off to re re see um, Zulu and <laughs> Zulu oh, yes. <laughs> one, <laughs> which I haven't seen for years. Uh, uh, Zulu, so oh, shame on you, shame and, on you. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I know if we could unmute ourselves and show our appreciation, if we can, um, in the sort of usual way. Thank you very much. Okay, fine, thank you very much. There's some silent clapping. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, and I uh, and I hope you continue to enjoy yourself in uh, in Cornwall. <laughs> yes, well, you, well, you can all go out into the garden now. <laughs> I know we'll all rush out. Thank you. Okay. Thank bye. you. Goodbye. Bye bye. Bye bye. 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 bye.